All right, let's wing it with an experimental outdoor podcast, shall we? Okay, <laughs> we have bird noises and nature noises. Yeah. It'll be great. You guys are going to get a little bird song in the background, but hopefully that <laughs> just brings out the sort of connectedness of the enterprise, right? Because we are at Connected Enterprise 2017. I'm joined by the masterminds behind Team Ability, and I owe them a lot because a couple of years ago, they actually took me through this. We could talk more about that because I learned a lot about my own, even though I'm not really a very functioning team member in a corporate setting, I learned a lot about what I bring to the table and also kind of what roles aren't good for me, which is really important. Um, and that's why I want to talk with these guys today because uh, teams are kind of a cliche and, oh, I have a good team or my team sucks, but it's actually, there's a lot more precision we can apply to it than that. I'm looking forward to getting into that with you guys. Yeah, that'll be great. So I'm joined by Mark and Janice or Dr. Janice, shall we say? <laughs> And you just have a new book out, which you signed for me. So we'll include a mention of that in the description as well. But it's about team ability, and that's the name of your organization yes. and also of your concepts. Yes, indeed. So, Mark, you're going to give us a little bit of background on all just, this. Just a little bit. Uh, the whole uh, This all came about because um, of the interest in the difference between individual attributes and teaming behaviors. So rather than getting into a whole lot of detail, I'll just simply say that at a certain point, Dr. Janice and a, and a person named Dr. Jack Gerber started working together. As behavioral scientists, they'd been observing the results of all different kinds of personality traits testing, aptitudes testing, and many other kinds of tests, which now include more recently the addition of things like uh, EQ tests, strengths finder tests, predictive index tests, and so on and so forth, all of which are based on the idea of self-inventory questionnaires. And not that there's anything wrong with that. You can find out a lot of things about the different parts and pieces of a person described as, let's say, um, uh, aggressiveness, extroversion, and so on, although they're given different names. Well, the problem with that is not that there's anything wrong with it, but rather it doesn't go quite far enough to tell you what teaming is about. So Dr. Janice and Dr. Jack got together and they set to work on the mission of figuring out what is teaming actually. How do people connect with teams? And is there some way to use that information to make working life better? And it just took about 25 years and nine years of tech development. And now we have that. Mm. Lean startup in a nutshell, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Very lean. <laughs> Very lean. Uh, was uh, It was an interesting experience. The first thing we did was I went back to my first love physics and systems. I'm really a system scientist. Uh, you know, wrote my first line of code very long time ago. Machine language. IBM wow. 650. Yeah. Got some cobalt there. And, oh, that was kind of considered modern. But once you've... <laughs> Once you've, uh, right. well, you know, half Once you the, master machine language, that you can move on to COBOL. It's nice. The, the big problem is getting our uh, carbon-based life forms sometimes to interact well with our silicon-based life sure. forms. And, you know, we've got to, we've got to, we try to get particularly tech projects done and everybody evaluates their team and says, I've got a great team or whatever. And they base it on, can I stand working with these people? And right. do we have either a minimum viable product or do we ha you know have have we achieved whatever it is at at least um, not more than three times as long as we were supposed to do it in you know or we haven't gone over budget by 700 percent we win uh, but that's not really enough and uh, we didn't want that we wanted to actually produce business value see I wasn't only a techie I also was a business person Right. You might not have known. Did you know I ran a sheet metal manufacturing company at one we time in my... We covered that. Right. Well, well I that's did. That's a separate podcast. Yeah, that's that. right. Okay. But you know what? <laughs> it's, 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 the same, it's the same thing. If you right. don't have the handoffs right, then your manufacturing's not going to work great. Your tech's not going to work great. You know, your sports team, you know this from sports. Sure. Sports teams are better when the handoffs are right. So we asked ourselves the question, how can we measure what's going right. on in that handoff? Because right. it's the white space on the org chart. Well, I still see a lot of times people mostly function in teams in terms of, oh, I, I like this person or I don't like that person. And I'm really troubled by that because to me, like there's, this is my bias, but I don't think there's a whole lot of room for personal feelings when you're committed to, it's just like a sports thing. You don't have time for infighting if you're trying to quote unquote win the championship or whatever. And I think work is the same. And, and my thing is like, well, you think you don't like that person, but what if they were in a role that was suited for them and they were pulling their own weight in a way that you never expected? Because a lot of times you don't like them because they're unhappy in their situation. 
if you've not found them a better situation, then I think, he, you know, you, may, you might not never be like, oh, this is my best friend, but you would appreciate what they do well, you know? Were you listening in when we were having our early discussions? Because this no. was the beginning. This was okay. the beginning of the idea that we had to look at what was going on from the team's point of view. So we started to look at the team as a living, breathing entity right? so that we could then ask it, what do you need? Because if the team's needs were met, we'd achieve whatever we were supposed to be right. achieving. And it got all that, I like you, I don't like you, out of the picture. And so that led to the a uh, whole lot of development and the realization that what we were talking about as teaming was not what other people were talking about. They were right. talking about, you know, did the personalities get along well together? We were looking at really the physics of it. Mm -hmm. And from that perspective... And so that led to us to line out and to really understand what universally all teams need. There happen to be 10 different things all teams need, but the people who want to contribute in that way, to make a meaningful contribution that way, they don't all look the same. And you can't identify them. They don't have the same resume. Right. It's their desire to give. And... You know, it's uh, you didn't care about liking, but let me tell you a little bit about what corporate love looks like. Oh, oh wow. not the salacious kind. No, no, not that stuff. No, we're not getting in HR prison here. No, no. not me. I but, haven't signed enough uh, disclosures and disclaimers to but do that. <laughs> think about how awesome it is to be contributing in your way. So, you know, for me, that's right. big picture vision and, you know, strategy and all that. But to have somebody on your team who's contributing in a completely different way, maybe, you know, debugging, start doing the, uh, the things that you don't like, you're going to have two reasons to love them. Mm -hmm. One, they're contributing to the same team you're on, and two, they're doing it. You don't have to. Right. Mark, sounds like you're trying to, were you trying to cut in there? No, no, no. I was just, I was just spacing. Oh, you were just, she was getting... She's getting, oh, right. Yeah, you were helping her with mic form. Yeah, she was getting a little too chummy. <laughs> yeah. So, so now, that, now that you're holding the mic, let's ask you, if a company wants to work with you guys, what is the process of getting started with this? How does this work? Uh, it's pretty simple. It's straightforward. Uh, we usually wind up talking to a senior executive or CEO or a business owner. And the reason for that is, is that this is very new stuff. And it's actually better to talk with people who aren't very familiar with a lot of the other kinds of things that have been being used for so many years because people tend to mistake what we have to offer for those. They want to so, slot it into like, oh, you're kind of like Myers-Briggs or whatever. We, yeah. yeah. And what we found out is that we were spending way too much time trying to explain the differences Got it. when we were talking with people who were familiar with those things or even had certain preferences or likings for those types of tools. And when we talked to senior executives, and this would just be one example, um, there's a company in Philadelphia that a few years back was growing by leaps and bounds. It was about $350 million a year on its way to being a billion-a-year company. I was introduced to the CEO, and after a little bit of breakfast conversation, he said, so what is this thing? Are you like a personality test or some kind of interviewing thing or what is it? Because we've used all those different – we've used everything we could find, and it hasn't made a difference. We have 30% turnover on new hires, and we can't move the needle. And I said, well, no, this isn't anything like those. It's new technology, and it measures how people team. It will tell you how to construct a, 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 um, a positive, constructive collaboration in your organization. He said, I'll have somebody call you. So we started working with the VP of HR who called and said, my boss told me we have to use your technology. I said, I'm sorry. <laughs> we didn't want to speak. We didn't want to step on anybody's toes. And she cut me off and said, no, no, no. She said, we really need help. And I think this is very interesting. So we're thinking, okay, that's wonderful. <laughs> so the end result was that uh, they began using team ability to screen candidates before they ever brought them in to interview, just simply to mm -hmm. find a group of candidates whose basic skills, um, uh, resume, previous experience would be a fit. And right. then they would pick the three or four of them, and then they would put them through team ability. And when based on the team ability results, they would bring them in at that point. And from the first day they started using it, they had no new hire turnover at all for two and a half years while they grew by more than 500 people. That's nuts. 
That's crazy. Yeah, yeah I've had people tell, call me a liar for saying yeah. that, but it was actually, that was the it example. It is a little that, bit of a too good to be true story. <laughs> it does sound ways. too good to be true, but it was actually documented by the company, and that's how it won a Supernova Award in the first year of the Constellation Connected Enterprise. Yeah, and I think one thing listeners might find interesting is that, and I don't know if this has changed a little bit, because you guys put me through your test a couple of years ago for as if I was doing this as part of a team, mm -hmm. but it was a deceptively simple series of questions, really. Um, Actually, you get to star in a series of 10 movies, right. because movies are just like work teams. Yeah. And what we're secretly doing, you know, I'm the technology architect, yeah. and, and a woman, I, I know that's impossible, but I am. Wow. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> and uh, so what we're doing is a, a li <laughs> There are young women listeners, aren't there? Oh, absolutely. I hope there are. Absolutely and there are. There do will it. be more now. Don't wait your, as please don't wait appearance. as long as I did. Yeah. And what we're doing is eliciting how you team with our little silicon-based life forms. Or they're, not, right. they're not quite real. Uh, and from that, we know how you contribute to a team. And you know what, John? You are a team player. You are playing with everybody who listens to you. Right. You're the information provider yeah. to a huge team. Right. It's just that you may not be in the same room with them. Well, yeah. you know what? <laughs> if you were like in a regular company, you'd be the guy I'd go to to manage the virtual team because you don't need to have people sitting right there under your nose. Right. Well, and what I thought was interesting, so you you put the test taker through a bunch of narrative scenarios where they find themselves. It's like they're on movie sets. They're, they're going to star. And, and you ask them sort of what role you, know, uh, they, you, you, uh, might, play. That you might play, that you might yeah, hate. You might, somebody, you might be Captain know. Ahab. You might be. You, you know, might be. Whatever it might be. <laughs> yeah. But I think what was what was so interesting is I finished the test and I was like, that was kind of fun. But I was like, there's just no way that that she got like a really good sense of who I was from taking that test. There's just no way. I enjoyed doing it, but I was like, nah. And then you sent me back the results, and I was really struck by them. And it was it came at a time in my career where I was really going through a lot of transitions because I had in an earlier part of my life I thought of myself as more like a manager and leader of bigger company type things, and I was more like managing a bunch of people and like. Um, and more and more, I had realized I was going through a change. And, and with Diginomica, when we started that, a uh, little before I took your test, um, there's no one to really manage in our organization, not in the <laughs> classic way. I've got four co-founders, and they don't want to be managed, certainly not by me. Um, and But that, I, that was a natural shift I was making anyway. And, and when you came back with the results, I was really struck by it because it kind of nailed that transition that I was undergoing. And I don't know how you constructed that test. Um, well, I do. Witch, yeah, witchcraft involved as well. Um, as, what's what's uh, the art? My favorite quote is the Arthur C. Clarke quote: yeah. "And he sufficiently advanced technology yeah. is indistinguishable from magic." Right. So I've given up. I would personally get shocked every time I look at the results on someone, and then I'd meet with them, maybe even casually, and they'd start telling me stories that were right there laid right. out, and it's because. We're not looking at pieces of you. It's about how do you interact. Yeah. And uh, Mark's probably ready to grab the, the mic. And it's a great example of how people team. So, so I was, uh, so I started the company because I'm a big picture f right. founder as a role, as we, as we define it. You know, yeah. lots of people are founders, but I started this with a completely different view that I might not even live to see the full flowering of it. And Mark will tell you a little bit about where it's going. But I'm the person who moves in that vision and I write more words and speak more words and come up with more ideas than anybody really should. I, and I'm not any good at figuring out which ones are actually going to work or be actionable. And so what I do is I am so blessed to have Mark, who's a vision former, and what he does is shape them up and form them. That book, I uh, truly, I wrote all those words in about three and a half weeks. I think it took him about a year or so to turn it into a book that actually could be could be something. And it's because of when you when you're both contributing and as as more mm. people join to the same needs of this this abstract thing that we call a team, but it's real and it's living. Sure. 
then there's an enormous amount of trust that grows up that you really um, have faith in each other to come through for the good of the team. Right. And just for our listeners, just just for clarity, you've referred to a couple of the personas you guys, including vision, former, and founder, uh-huh. but you guys have identified like a number of different personas. Uh, yeah. So that's, we that's call them the, role. Yeah. We okay. call them role with a capital Roles. R, but it explains yeah. why very often if you're leading, let's say a scrum team, even anything, mm-hmm. you, you're doing any kind of project, but it's particularly notable in tech because the output is so easy. What we do is we fail to respect our, what Ray Wong calls the digital artisans. Mm -hmm. People are so, and it's just because they're not like management. If they wanted to manage people, they'd have jobs that would manage people. But what gives them that feeling of satisfaction is making things, making it work better, or um, finding some cool new technology and bringing it back to the team. And so by there's there's now a way not only to design the team, but there's an operating system of teamwork. So right. I'm going to let the more organized person of um, our <laughs> two-person team here yeah. handle that. Yeah. And basically, uh, we previously mentioned that <clears throat> this was all about understanding how people seek to serve the needs of a team. And every team has specific needs. Uh, not all teams have all the needs. There are 10 basic areas that teams need to be serviced. One is to have a future. One is to have resources. One is to have people who pull other people together or organize activities and so on. And that's where all all those, what we call roles really are, is specific ways of service to the needs of a team. So what we're able to do with team ability by identifying how a particular person really has a deeply seated desire to serve a particular need that mm. and when you turn that into management information, that means that a manager or a team leader can begin to align people with work that is of the nature, not all their work necessarily, even just some, maybe just 25% of their work of the time that they're doing, they're doing something that they feel personally is meaningful. And that's extremely important, more so than ever with millennials, sure. because they've been acculturated to feel that they should be always doing something that is meaningful. Well, we just had some questions this morning after the Radical Candor keynote expressing frustration about the challenge of, of sort of managing millennials and such. And, and then digital transformation has been the other big theme of the conference, obviously, and, and the challenges around culture change and people change. And, and to your point around artisans, I think all these things sort of fit in with this notion that, that we're not taking advantage of the talent that we have, you know, so... Yeah, there was a, a great question that was raised about the idea of measuring energy, and I wasn't going to do a commercial on somebody else's time, but I actually went over to the person and I said, you know, what you really are trying to measure is available energy. Right. And so there is, a, this comes out of physics, so we're able to measure, do you have somebody who has unused energy? You know, some of us like to have low stress jobs. And then there are those of us who are only happy when we're insane entrepreneurs. Right. And you know, it's a, they're completely different I worlds. I have that affliction, unfortunately. It's a wonderful, I, you know, <laughs> but we love it. But because we do, we shouldn't be inflicting it on people right. who just don't do their best work that way. Mm. Yeah, and continuing that concept, and this is what really distinguishes team ability from other things that are out there that people have been working on and kind of trying to figure out these sorts of problems of managing people and teams and getting the building collaborative cultures and all of those other things that people all seem to desire is that when you understand, I already mentioned that when you understand a person's deep desire to make a particular service to a team need, then you not only can align people with work that they will find meaningful, but you can also align the people on the team with the needs of a team, which is uh, uh, associated with what Janice just said, which is that certain teams, let's say a strategic planning team, is going to need people who have very vision-oriented right. uh, ways of teaming. Uh, that they That's just how they operate. They think big picture. So you want a founder and you want a vision mover and maybe a vision former and a few other people who will contribute valuable points, but it's essential to have the vision in that type of an organization. By the same token, if you have a customer service group, 
you're going to need people who are really about communicating and solving people's problems and meeting people's needs, which are some of the other, the communicator and the, and the watchdog seeks to serve people's needs. A communicator builds community, puts people together, loves to talk, and tends to be very likable. So the understanding of this actually becomes not just a collection of pieces of information about individuals, but rather what Jana said, an operating system of teamwork in which you begin to understand not only how to align people with work and people with teams and the needs of a team, but also how to interact with people in, a const in the most p constructive way. So if you have, so let's say you want to praise someone for doing some work and you happen to know that that person is an action mover, who seeks to simply do lots of things and they get their they get their pleasure and their enjoyment and their sense of satisfaction out of getting things done give them a big checklist and they're happy and they'll come back and it'll all be done you would say you did a great job you banged off that whole list wow fantastic thank you but if you're talking to a founder whose vision is big picture long term and really not about themselves at all the mission the mission the big picture mission becomes the most important thing if you want to say hey nice mission work that's not going to click right that's what will click is i believe in this vision and i'm going to commit myself to it that's a thank you to a founder could you say that again i really <laughs> like that yeah. I, i'm a, sorry i'm a founder right. if yeah. you know he's, it's he's playing to your well, there, huh? he, you know, I mean, that's how you he manage. He knows how his bread is buttered. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, that that's how it goes. And, and the cool thing is that we've operationalized this into this whole process of analyzing team performance and then producing a playbook, just like in sports, but right. a playbook that's written the way that the leader leads, because you, you and I could be leading a team with exactly the same people, and I actually don't like to manage people any more than you do, but that's why I have such a great team. What, what this is, is it's written the way we are and the way our real people are. So because we're different, our playbooks would be different. Right. Because one of the purposes is not just to have everybody manage better, but to at the end of the day, you want to be better at leading or managing the way you are. Right. So we've overcome, I think, a series of skeptical points around, like, can teams be improved? Can teams be measured? Can can we identify sort of roles that fit people? Somehow, magically, we can. Um, there's one more piece of the puzzle from a corporate perspective, which is, I can hear people thinking, oh, that's all very well and good to idealistically slot people into the perfect roles. But I'm running a company right now. I've got a lot of grunt work. I've got a lot of work that no one really likes to do. Um, you know, I'd love to put people in their ideal roles, but I need this person to do that, whether they like it or not. So what you're usually doing yeah. is you're screening out the people who love to do what you think is grunt work, but that makes their heart sing. There you go. See, lots of times, if mm. the next time I see an entry TBS level reports, job, huh? yeah, the next time I, I, love I see filing an entry level job, there are. You know what? <laughs> yeah. The next time I see a job description for an entry level job that says, must have leadership skills. Are you serious? Mm. Or how about the sales jobs? Must be organized. Come many, on. Many, many years ago, I was a recruiter. Um, this is how I originally got an enterprise software in the mid nineties, my favorite job order of all time. Cause we used to get job orders from other recruiters coming through the fax machine, big block letters, worker bees only. I love it. Do you want to identify like, worker wow. bees? You know? That, yeah. That, that gives me, I was like, thanks a lot. I can just ask people over the phone when I'm screening them. So are you kind of a worker bee? Uh, uh, it, it, you can't but screen that's kind it of what verbally. you're implying, right? Yeah. Well, <laughs> implying, I'll tell you. So we have a wonderful, robust internship program because our first intern made it happen, actually, and designed the whole thing. Um, and what if somebody comes through and they happen to be the most wonderful founder or vision mover or vision former on earth, they're not going to fit and be happy with the work that interns do. Now, they do a lot of great stuff, social media, and they get to do their version of leading or decision making or doing, trying out things and being risky. But they really, really love doing things like. I had someone who just loved suggesting which emojis would go well with which tweet. 
So you're embracing a you're embracing a vision that the problem in 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 my example is more my own biases around it's, what kind of work is yeah. is is fun or not, and then uh, we and all then, have and, them. And you're embracing a more idealistic view, which could be also very practical, which is that in a company there's kind of a right role for everyone. That's kind of what you're implying. Do, every, everybody so. has goodness, and okay. I hate when we say, "Oh, that person sucks" or whatever. No, give them the kind of work that aligns with the way in which they're going to contribute, whether you like it or not, the, you may not want to do right. that work. Give that to them and watch them turn into a happy, productive human being. And okay. by the way, they'll be a big, better citizen and neighbor and uh, family okay. person. Yeah, I think. And, uh, and the other core, the, I guess you could say the next step that I saw coming was like, okay, well, we did talk about one point of value where that comes, but there are, there are others. Besides, what, I mean, once you organize people and work and teams, and then you begin to propagate the environment, the working environment, with awareness where each person, through their own self-coaching report mm -hmm. that we produce for them, begin to understand their own way of teaming and to learn how other people team in ways that are different so that everyone begins to think of other people as, well, they're just contributing different from me. So the fact that I'm big picture and they seem to always want to be down in the weeds mm -hmm. fixing little problems or organizing stuff is really mm -hmm. just that I understand now that we're fundamentally different and I can be more respectful of their work. It actually is a... Um, uh, a wonderful way to pull people together. So and so loves wallowing in minutia. I'll just let them do that. There are know? people who love to wallow in minutia. Absolutely. You know, and instead you know what, of instead you know of funny, just, hopefully they'll find a nugget in there someday. The, the you know what's know? really funny <laughs> is that, and this again comes around to it. We come from a basic idea of that people, different people, team differently. Right. And different leaders lead differently. And then we go through all of this. By the way, you had mentioned that this seemed very simplistic, but actually underneath. It is very right. complex. Well, you spent <laughs> we well, aren't going to go into the details. You spent twenty five years on it, but yeah, yeah, you buried the complexity in the exam. It, you I buried I, it I in figured, there. I figured I figured that part out, and then I did figure that part that's out. That's right. And yeah. then what happens is it all comes back to people working with other people, and we've all seen all these different mm -hmm. kinds of things. We've seen people who love to look, bury themselves in minutia, and we've seen people who are always you know, kind of out in outer space thinking about big picture stuff. Now we actually can put it into context and increase the level of awareness and appreciation between people so that teams mm. actually do develop real team chemistry. It is a real thing. Yeah. And real profits for real companies because that's a concern yeah. also. I mean, sure. if, you're, if you're thinking of investing in a company, you can put a valuation on the tech or whatever, but if you want to put a valuation on the team, Mm. You need some pretty deep information and works for that too. Well, I think I can meet you two thirds of the way on this one, which is that I think that I can't think of an organization that couldn't benefit from taking approaches like this. And to Mark's point, I can't really think of individuals that couldn't benefit from sort of the two pronged approach of learning more in a nuanced way about what you're good at, what your strengths are, but also maybe appreciating like other types of strengths that you don't have. I think it's so important to understand that. And certainly you can aspire to things that you, mm -hmm. that you're not particularly good at at the moment. So I, but, but I would say where your ultimate challenge would be to, I would say your oh, ultimate oh, oh, oh. challenge is United Airlines. Oh, um, <laughs> that's another so thing. So if United you know, Airlines, you, you, if United Airlines is listening to this, I'd like them to bring you guys in yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and perform team ability on these that. guys <laughs> There's and, one and thing fix that, you that said. company. Because if you can fix them, then, yeah. then, then I think you're gold. That would be really yeah. cool. And Janice <laughs> will have something to say about that in a minute. I just wanted to mention that you used the strengths a couple of times when you referred yeah. to people, people find out about them. You can, in a way it is their strength. But fundamentally, the strength uh, derives from something deeper, which is their personal connection to serving a particular type of team need. Right. And when you if when you make that distinction, you realize that you're not just talking about a, t a checklist of strengths, yeah. but rather a holistic view of how people interact in teams and where true positive chemistry actually comes You're from. almost taking it from a more primal perspective of that we have this sort of deeper drive for purpose and yes. and, and it's kind of unique to each individual. Yeah. I was just going to say thank you, American Airlines. There was some very cool teaming on my flight out. Okay, and, uh, all right. So, and so maybe I, they're um, already heading in that direction. Uh, huh? Well, <laughs> okay. 
much. No, we would welcome. Uh, we would welcome. Actually, American, you are our our home base. We're in Philadelphia. Okay, well, if you can uh, fix but, American, uh, but, that would, it would be equally uh, impressed. But, uh, oh. but you know, you know, we occasionally do fly United, and you know what? It's visible. Teaming is actually visible to outsiders. It relates to how you how you interact with each other is going to clearly be related into how you interact with your customers. You know, we know that. We know the data on satisfaction well, and inside I will, and, and customers. I, I will that. certainly say, even the in the beleaguered airline industry, at least beleaguered from a customer perspective, they're making a lot of money somehow. Um, like on certain flights, you can kind of tell when a crew is clicking, right? You can kind of tell when, oh, they've, yeah. when they've worked together a long time and they kind of everyone kind of knows. And even the way they move in the aisle, they anticipate each other's movements and stuff. And and so you certainly see that in, in certain sort of pockets of enlightened culture, but mm-hmm. within the within that broader thing of like, wow, you know, this company is needs this these principles in a much broader way, you know? Exactly. And it makes for so much nicer an experience when you are buying anything from a vendor company where people are actually connecting, your service happens better, people are responsive, and it's because of the handoffs. That's why you love the team, that the winning team, any sports team, mm. because all sports uh, come down to the handoff. It's a, the ball gets hand, handed off, the puck gets handed off. It's still what's going on in that space between sure. people, and it's just as important in your business. In fact, it can be life or death in your business. Well, I don't want Mark to miss his ride to the airport of this podcast. Oh, yeah. to really have a sad ending. How are we doing there? Are you We're getting doing pretty okay. close? A few more minutes. Okay. Uh, I could. I was going to say we could give you just some other kinds of examples of how it's yeah. used because mostly we've been talking about inside the team and working with an existing team. But we've had some other interesting um, clients. We have a uh, a chain of coffee companies that have. Um, are interested, uh, I'm sorry, a, a company that has a chain, a small chain of coffee uh, cafes. And they're um, looking at using it to um, run a team analysis on their most productive teams in stores and then compare that to the least productive teams in stores. Mm. And from that information, we can be able to say, based on who's on the team and what job they're fulfilling and align that up with role, what we would call a role fit, team fit, uh, analysis, and then we can basically tell them, okay, well, if you have this, these different roles or ways of serving the team, and you have this level of coherence, and you have teaming characteristics that are generally pretty good, that's what you're seeing in your high-performing teams, and that's what you need to replicate in your other teams. We actually did that on a, on a larger scale with a company in the insurance industry that was growing very rapidly and very successfully in Philadelphia, they wanted to open a West Coast office, and they said, what we want to know is how to replicate this team in terms of team interaction and people aligned with jobs and open a California office. They did that, and I noticed about a year later, they're one of the fastest growing companies in Philadelphia. On the, like They were like 11 on the top 50 mm-hmm. list. And uh, we just heard from them recently. They sold the company, and uh, I think it was described as lottery money was what they got mm-hmm. back. Uh, big, big dollars for it. Another way to look at it is post-merger. We've had a situation where uh, with a company that's a medical device company, uh, two companies were merged by their private equity investors. Everything seemed to be fine until all of a sudden the product really started to take off in the marketplace. And then the wheels are coming off the wagon because there were a whole lot of uh, teaming issues that were had been unresolved while the team was kind mm. of in this fallow state. And then when they all had to start performing, they had problems with supply chain. They had problems with customer relationships. They had probably with delivery times on stuff that was absolutely needed on time w- where the product was actually de- delivered an hour before a surgery on someone's spine. Mm. So, uh, and then that was completely, all those problems were fixed. So, uh, another way would be, and especially since we're talking here in, you know, close to Silicon Valley, um, would be a venture capitalist evaluating the prospects for a team or for merging mm-hmm. a team or merging two teams. An, and under, an up underrated a, characteristic of startups, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I've, that strong versus weak teams is a super interesting point, and I'd love to learn more about that at some point because it's, you know, my, my, my tendency to be like, well, the stronger team was the more talented, more motivated team, but there may be more details on that that would be interesting to learn about. Well, just look at sports. You know, you can have yeah. a team that's got the sure. 
let's just say from my perspective, the best bodies, you know, those pump and right. iron hot guys. And they are tab they can throw faster. I think you look at sports slightly differently than me, but oh, well, uh, <laughs> did I? I that, but, but that's I, I how see your point. that's how technology architects look at it. Oh, right. I'm sorry, just that's a small right. subset yeah. of us, the ones that are. We do enjoy our sports, and um, you know they can be the most incredible, talented throwers or catchers mm. or whatever they the sport is, but something is not going on on that team mm -hmm. is it the leadership is it the coaches I, team analysis will, will tell you we'll tell right you where it is, it is. Yeah. and then all that money you spent on these wonderfully talented people mm -hmm. can pay off might, one, one way that might be sum, sum that up succinctly would just be to say that we're not going to say that that teaming is more important than talent but we are going to say that teaming when it's done right when it's working right when it's inherently right is going to bring out the greatest in the talent that's available. And that's why some teams have mm -hmm. won the World Series or the, you know, the Super Bowl without having any real superstars on them. Right. Uh, the only sports book I ever read and enjoyed was Moneyball. For sure. <laughs> Someone gave it to me and said, I think sure. they're doing what you're doing. And they were doing that without the operationalization. Well, and I think it, what was but... really interesting about that is that he never won a championship using that but he obviously had a lot of success i mean mm -hmm. and and in sports we often take an all or nothing view whereas in, in many ways he was a very successful franchise but it was about doing more with less and what's super interesting is as a red sox fan i can tell you that when we won our first championship in god knows how many decades part of the fruits of that was applying a combination of the the more money ball approaches which are similar to yours but then it was also spending money on on super talent so it was sort of a combination of and and all but ultimately it had to be a team obviously but it's, it's sort of interesting it was like talent plus team kind of was the formula there you know? oh yeah now there's a there's a pro ball team and i'm not going to name them because you know who uh it's just started uh, doing some work with us and i'm going to be fascinated to see if they can drive that into the player area yeah and see the win and i guess that'll have to be the year that i have to root for not the home team well it's interesting because <laughs> one of the boston celtics best teams of all time one of the reasons it was one of the best teams is you had bill walton Mm -hmm. this hall of fame center coming off the bench and so he had embraced his role as a six man right and a lot of guys in his position wouldn't have done that but then you bring this guy off the bench it's like oh my god and and so i think that's where it starts to get interesting is how people accept roles and that make sense to them and, and see how they they could be uniquely a contributor so i guess you can learn from sports in that regard oh there are amazing uh people who are being underutilized in organizations all over. And uh, and we can say that yeah. because part of making your life better is letting you get exposed to all the things, not only that you can do now, but the things that are in your near future. And that's what's important for millennials. You know, they'll they'll accept being in whatever job it is if you, that you give them enough interesting stuff. But what do you do about the ones who on day one really would right. like to lead the, lead the thing? Day one of my first real job, I mean, when I was just out of college, um, I wanted to run it. And I knew right out of the right out of the box, there were areas that could run better and that people weren't doing anything about it. And, uh, well, you know, frustration leads you to be an entrepreneur. Well, we should wrap up soon, but I, I, I hope that more companies think about hiring for potential. I, I did an interview with a CFO the other day uh, who talked about that, how... In her, she, it's create exceptional workplaces was her presentation that she gave, and she was talking about how when they hire people, they're hiring people based on envisioning how they might grow into roles over time, and how they have structured ways within their company of exposing people to different things so they can do that. Because I think so many people, it's a tragedy when they don't ever get the opportunity to discover what they're good at and and have it nurtured along to the point where they can excel. And she started at the, at that company as just a uh, you know a entry-level accountant and then evolved into a CFO because she was given room to do that. And I think in a lot of companies still, they don't think like that. And if they don't have that mindset, then they're not going to be able to take full advantage of what you're talking about, unfortunately. Right. Well, with teamability, they can have the roadmap for that on day one to sure. know 
you know, where can I move this person? And pipeline's getting important because it's get recruiting. Boy, yep. you're ha- probably going to be happy that you're out of that. That's a oh, yeah. tough one these days. It is. Oh, so I bailed tough. on that ship. Thank God. But, <laughs> but no, you're right. It would help. It would certainly help. Well, thanks yeah. a lot. Any final thoughts, Mark? Are we good? I think uh, just that we really appreciate your your sure. interest in what we're doing, John, and yeah. we hope the other the folks that you communicate with will take action. Thanks we'd for love all. to talk with them. Yep. And we'll see you next year next at year. Constellation Connected, Connected Enterprise, Enterprise 2018. Yeah. If the scheduling gods align, that will happen. And I uh, hope you guys enjoyed the birds and maybe even heard the crackling of the fire behind us. But this is definitely one of the more scenic podcasts I've ever done. So in fact, uh, we'll wrap on that note, but thanks a lot. Take care.